I want to share with you a technique for DMET graft unfolding that is extremely useful in a variety of different circumstances. This technique was not invented by me, but rather instead by a Japanese ophthalmologist named Takahiko Hayashi. He is a brilliant corneal specialist who has a YouTube channel in which he has described a number of really impressive surgical techniques, including this one, the double bubble technique. It is useful for graft unfolding in situations of hyper deep anterior chamber. The most notorious setup for that of course, it's an eye that is post vitrectomy. But you may find many other situations in which the anterior chamber is unexpectedly deep. Now, one such situation is in an eye of an elderly patient. This patient here on the operating room table, this patient is in their late 80s. And in elderly people, the vitreous is syneretic and therefore nearly entirely liquefied and consequently provides minimal, if any, posterior support. So these eyes behave very much as though they have been vitrectomized, eyes of very elderly patients. In addition, this eye has been treated for a long, long time for wet macular degeneration with intravitreal injections and just the unending cascade of intravitreal injections tends to cause changes in the eye, especially to the zonules, such that the lens may hang back a little bit further or be less stable. And these eyes often present with very deep anterior chambers. Now this particular patient also you'll notice, he has a prior DSEC and this DSEC is living it is a viable, alive endothelial graft, but you'll notice that it's a little bit temporally decentered in this patient. And at the interface, it's just a little bit hazier than a normal cornea is. So this DSEC is alive, it's living, but this patient came to us with complaints about the quality of his vision and hoping to improve how well he was able to function in the world, we thought maybe to replace this DSEC graft with a DMEC. So if you're going to endeavor to do such a thing to replace a living, functional, healthy endothelial graft, you need to be quite confident at your ability to pull off the surgery. This is certainly somebody that you could make worse if you put an endothelial graft into the eye and the surgery doesn't work. You'll notice that we're stripping the endothelial graft off the back surface of the cornea using air. So this is a 27 gauge anterior chamber maintainer connected to an air pump. And I like an air fill for the anterior chamber when doing decimeterexis because that provides unparalleled visibility and contrast to help me see what I'm doing. And not only do I need to see to be able to remove the DSEC graft from the eye, but often eyes that have had DSEC are understripped. In other words, they have this large, thick, fibrotic rim peripherally of unstripped decimase membrane and endothelium. And you need to, number one, be able to see that, and number two, be able to remove that from the eye if you're planning on putting a DMAC graft in. The reason is that these unstripped fibrotic rests are topographically irregular. They create an uneven posterior corneal surface, and the DMAC graft is much less likely to stick so unless you want to deal with intractable graft attachment, it's necessary to remove them. And remember, we're trying to improve the optical performance of this eye. So if there are any remnants left centrally in the interface, those can likewise diminish the quality of the patient's vision. So I am extremely meticulous about stripping all of these scattered rests of decimase membrane and, and, and endothelium from the posterior corneal surface. And the best way to make sure you're getting them all is to use air. The other place you wanna make special attention that you don't have these unstripped remnants hanging out is around the wounds because they tend to get trapped 
in the wounds when trying to extract them. So I'm also extremely careful that I'm not leaving little debris in the wound that I'm trying to pull these little strips out of. That can be really embarrassing when post-operatively you see tattered shreds of Decimase membrane hanging out of the eye. This is a Mellis scraper that I'm using to scrape these little rests off the back of the cornea. I try to engage them and pull and that sort of clears them off the back surface of the eye. And this is the longest part of the surgery. It's not the graft unfolding, it's preparing the bed for putting the new endothelial cells into. That's the component of the operation that I spend the very most time doing because I think that's the critical component of this operation. Now, I'm going to make a peripheral iridotomy in this patient, but I wait to do that until after the stripping is done. And the reason is, is that when you're stripping the endothelium, you may have some chamber instability. And if so, you want to try to keep the vitreous back during that period of time. You don't want the vitreous herniating up through an iridotomy, so I like to wait until all of the stripping has been done and the chamber is stable before I make an inferior peripheral iridotomy. How I make that iridotomy differs depending on in which location I am operating. When we operate, when we do DMAC in our office-based treatment facility, we use a capsular rexus handpiece which operates via a basically a diathermy principle. It cauterizes a hole in the far peripheral iris. I really like that because it is a reusable, non-disposable, very safe tool for making an iridotomy. It cauterizes as it cuts, so you have very, very minimal risk of bleeding. When I operate at the eye hospital, which is our other location for surgery, they don't have access to that tool. This capsular rexus handpiece is a unique feature of the Ertli, O-E-R-T-L-I platform. The eye hospital in which I operate, they don't have that fake emulsifying device there. So instead, I use a vitrectomy handpiece. Vitrectomy handpiece is a really good alternative for making an iridotomy because it likewise can make a very far peripheral hole in the iris. It's very, very controlled. It's very, very safe. And the other thing that I like about it is that in the event that you encounter vitreous ever during the case, either during the iridotomy or subsequently during graft unfolding, you have the vitrectomy handpiece right there ready to use. When you're doing complicated DMEC, there's so many situations in which you have surprise vitreous. So it can be really, really nice to have the vitrectomy handpiece just already there open. And if you have the luxury of having one of these at your facility, I highly recommend it. Now, meanwhile, you'll notice that I'm still preparing the posterior cornea for these new endothelial cells. And I'm meticulously scraping all of the little gradu left over that occupied the space in the interface where the old DSET graft was. This is your only chance ever to remove it. If you don't remove it there now, it'll be there forever. So it is so much better to take your time and get it out than to see it in the interface forever after you do the surgery. So once you've contented yourself that you have removed all that you can from the posterior corneal surface to smooth it, then it is time to make the iridotomy. So I usually do this not under air, but you'll notice I'm refilling the anterior chamber with balanced salt solution because that way I can see the iris vibrate. I can see it move. Whereas if you have the anterior chamber filled with air, you can't really see as you engage the iris. So you can't tell when you've made the iridotomy. So here we've made a very far peripheral iridotomy. I'm gonna supplement the anesthesia with a little bit of preservative free lidocaine to inject into the anterior chamber. And then I'm going to inject the DMEC graft into the eye. I'm using a 2.4 millimeter clear corneal incision, and that's completely and entirely sufficient to fit our DORC, D-O-R-C, glass injector into. In fact, it fits through a 2.2 millimeter wound. So I'll inject it into the anterior chamber, 
and then we have to unfold the graph. Now remember the point of this video is to show the double bubble technique for unfolding graphs in a hyper deep chamber. This is a hyper deep chamber because the patient has a cinematic vitreous and they've been getting these wet AMD injections which have compromised the zonules. So the whole lens iris diaphragm is hanging back. I like to use a big graft in these situations. And the reason it's a big graft, you can see it spreads out and it occupies space in the angle. The angle is where you're gonna get the most compression, the most apposition. It's where you get the most pinning. And therefore, big grafts are easier to open in hyper deep chambers than small grafts. That's a big tip. Now here you'll notice I'm checking the Motsuro sign. The tip of the cannula is blue. That means the graft is right side up. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place a bubble on top of the graft here. And you'll notice the bubble is not really interacting with the graft. It's sort of um, floating away from the graft. And the reason is the chamber is so deep, the graft is down below the bubble. The bubble is floating up high and the graft is down below it. So they're not really interacting. So I'm gonna try to maneuver the graft with a cannula to sort of push it over underneath the bubble. That's not really a good idea. That's not what you should do. You shouldn't try to put the bubble in and then move the graft over. What you do is you should center the graft in the eye. So then when you put a bubble, which floats up to the apex of the cornea in the center, it automatically engages with the graft, which is what was done here. So the problem was that the graft was decentered when the bubble was put in. So now I have the graft, which is yeah, largely unfolded. There's this air bubble, but if you remove the bubble, the graft will curl right back up. So what to do? Here, what you do is you put a second bubble underneath the graft. And you see now there are two bubbles in the eye, one underneath the graft and one on top. This is the double bubble. And then you remove the bubble from on top of the graft. So this is how you lift a graft up to the posterior corneal surface. It's by using a bubble on top of the graft to pin the graft open and then putting a second graft, a sec, second bubble underneath the graft to lift the graft up. And as the buff li the graft lifts, the top bubble shifts off to the side and you can aspirate and remove it. This is such a handy and useful trick to use in eyes that are post vitrectomy or otherwise have deep anterior chambers and you will inevitably encounter these cases no matter how strict your criteria are for which eyes get DMEC and which eyes don't because they're too difficult, you will encounter graphs that are tightly curled in eyes with deep chambers. And you think, how in the world am I gonna unfold this graft? You'll never do it through chamber shallowing alone. The only way to do it is using air bubbles and a bubble on top to hold the graft open and then a bubble below to lift and displace the top bubble. That is the double bubble technique that Takahiko Hayashi pioneered that is so useful for us. We use it all the time, every day, and doing DMAC in these eyes with deep chambers. So give it a shot. I think you'll like it.